Alright guys, I'm your first everyone down here and I'm just going to do a quick video on uh, some of my British home front uh, for some of my British home front equipment um, it's all original, every single piece my British stuff, I don't buy repro um, I speak yeah. to you for the first time as Prime Minister stuff, so. in a solemn hour for the life of our country of our empire of our allies and above all, of the cause of freedom. A tremendous battle is raging in France and Flanders. The Germans, by a remarkable combination of air bombing and heavily armored tanks, have broken through the French defenses north of the Maginot Line, and strong columns of their armored vehicles are ravaging the open country, which for the first day or two was without defenders. For myself, I have invincible confidence in the French army and its leaders. Only a very small part of that splendid army has yet been heavily engaged. And only a very small part of France has yet been invaded. There is good evidence to show that practically the whole of the specialized and mechanized forces of the enemy have been already thrown into the battle and we know that very heavy losses have been inflicted upon them. No officer or man, no brigade or division, which grapples at close quarters with the enemy wherever encountered, can fail to make a worthy contribution to the general result. The armies must cast away the idea of resisting attack behind concrete lines or natural obstacles, and must realize that mastery can only be regained by furious and unrelenting assault. And this spirit must not only animate the high command, but must inspire every fighting man. In the air, often at serious odds, often at odds, hitherto thought overwhelming, we have been clawing down three or four to one of our enemies. And the relative balance of the British and German air forces is now considerably more favorable to us than at the beginning of the battle. In cutting down the German bombers, we are fighting our own battle, as well as that of France. My confidence in our ability to fight it out to the finish with the German air force has been strengthened by the fierce encounters which have taken place and are taking place. At the same time, our heavy bombers are striking nightly at the taproot of German mechanized power and have already inflicted serious damage upon the oil refineries on which the Nazi effort to dominate the world directly depends. We must expect that as soon as stability is reached on the Western Front, the bulk of that hideous apparatus of aggression which dashed Holland into ruin and slavery in a few days, will be turned upon us. I'm sure I speak for all when I say we are ready to face it, to endure it, and to retaliate against it, to any extent that the unwritten laws of war permit. There will be many men and many women in this island who, when the ordeal comes upon them, as come it will, will feel comfort and even a pride that they are sharing the perils of our lads at the front, soldiers, sailors, and airmen, God bless them, and are drawing away for them a part, at least, of the onslaught they have to bear. Is not this the appointed time for all to make the utmost exertions in their power? If the battle is to be won, we must provide our men with ever-increasing quantities of the weapons and ammunition they need. We must have, and have quickly, more aeroplanes, more tanks, more shells, more guns. There is imperious need for these vital munitions. They increase our strength against the powerfully armed enemy. They replace the wastage of the obstinate struggle and the knowledge that wastage will speedily be replaced enables us to draw more readily upon our reserves and throw them in now that everything counts so much. 
Our task is not only to win the battle, but to win the war. After this battle in France abates its force, there will come the battle for our islands. For all that Britain is, and all that Britain means, that will be the struggle. In that supreme emergency, we shall not hesitate to take every step, even the most drastic, to call forth from our people the last ounce and the last inch of effort of which they are capable. The interests of property, the hours of labor, are nothing compared to the struggle for life and honor, for right and freedom, to which we have vowed ourselves. I have received from the chiefs of the French Republic, and in particular, from its indomitable Prime Minister, Monsieur Reynaud, the most sacred pledges that whatever happens, they will fight to the end, be it bitter, nor be it glorious. Nay, if we fight to the end, it can only be glorious. Having received His Majesty's commission, I have formed an administration of men and women of every party and of almost every point of view. We have differed and quarreled in the past, but now one bond unites us all, to wage war until victory is won, and never to surrender ourselves to servitude and shame, whatever the cost and the agony may be. If this is one of the most awe-striking periods in the long history of France and Britain, it is also, beyond doubt, the most sublime. Side by side, unaided except by their kith and kin in the great dominions and by the wide empires which rest beneath their shield, Side by side, the British and French peoples have advanced to rescue not only Europe, but mankind from the foulest and most soul-destroying tyranny which has ever darkened and stained the pages of history. Behind them, behind us, behind the armies and fleets of Britain and France, gather a group of shattered states and bludgeon great races, the Czechs, the Poles, the Norwegians, the Danes, the Dutch, the Belgians, upon all of whom the long night of barbarism will descend, unbroken even by a star of hope, unless we conquer, as conquer we must, as conquer we shall.